Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. For the first time in 20 years, locally transmitted cases of malaria have been reported in the U.S. Today, guest host Thomas Locke talks with Jane Carlton, the new director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, about her work decoding the genomes of the parasites that have infected individuals in the U.S. to determine their lineage and try to piece together a larger story of why and how malaria is popping up in places where it's no longer endemic. They also discuss the role of climate change in malaria infections, the global fight against the disease, and why the risk of contracting malaria is still quite small. Let's listen. Today we're focusing on a topic that doesn't often reach the headlines in the US, malaria. The US eliminated malaria over 70 years ago in 1951. Today, 9 out of 10 cases occur in Africa. Women and young children are most at risk. But wind back the clock and you'll see that the malaria map was once truly global. The US had sustained malaria transmission, especially during the Civil War, and still has the species of mosquito capable of transmitting malaria parasites. That's why, just this past summer, the disease did hit the headlines as locally transmitted cases of malaria were reported across three US states. So should we be concerned about these unusual cases? Is the public possibly at risk of this eliminated disease? And how can science like genomics help us better understand what's happened? Well, joining me to discuss these important questions is Jane Carlton, the new director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute. She takes over from Peter Augury, who led the institute, the world's largest academic centre focused on malaria, for over 15 years. Jane, I appreciate it must be very busy starting as director of JHMRI, but for those who don't know you and your background, maybe you could introduce yourself. Yes, sure, absolutely. Yes, I have been here for six weeks now, (laughs) which is uh, quite a short period of time. So I am Jane Carlton. I used to be the professor of genomics at the Center for Genomics and Systems Biology at New York University. And now I'm the director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute here in Baltimore. Very excited to be here and and thrilled to be working with a lot of fantastic colleagues here at the Institute. And to start off with, could you give us a quick sense of what happened this summer? Yes. So very unfortunately, over the past uh, few months over the summer, there have been cases in Texas, Florida, and last month in Maryland. The last time we had this local transmission, as it's called, was actually in 2003 with a couple of cases in Florida. And the issue about these locally transmitted cases is that they're different from the 2000 or so cases that we get in the US, which are from travelers. This is where a person who has never left the country or you know, not for many months is infected with malaria parasites because we still have the mosquitoes, the species of mosquitoes that can transmit the parasites. And so what probably has happened in those cases is that the Anopheles mosquito will have bitten an infected person, a traveler who brought the parasites back with them. And then the parasites develop in the mosquito. And then that mosquito will then bite another person and transmit the parasites on. I guess we've become quite familiar with COVID and the way that that's transmitted and can spread quite easily. But with something like this, you know, domestic malaria transmission in the US, the risk to the general public is quite low. It is exceedingly low. I think we want to try and avoid any sort of scaremongering. There are just very few cases. As I mentioned, 20 years ago was the last time something like this happened. It's a little unusual that have been a number of cases in different states this summer. That certainly is a, a very rare event. We've actually been contacted by the Maryland Department of Health 
to sequence the parasites of this infected individual. And so we're going to bring the full force of genomics to try and track down where the parasite that infected this person has come from. We have obtained a sample of blood from this individual and we extract the DNA, sequence it using these very high throughput machines. And then once we've got the sequence of the genome, Then we compare it, we do what's called comparative genomics, to other genomes. And we try and identify differences between the G, A, T, or C, which makes up a genome. We'll compare it to all of the other genomes of parasites from around the world and hopefully be able to identify which country those parasites may have come from. Just to take a step back, we hear the words genetics and genomics quite a lot. Some people may be familiar with the Human Genome Project. And maybe you could help us understand those words a little better. You know, what do we mean when we say genetics and genomics? What is this field of research? Yes, absolutely. So that's my field of research. That's what I studied for my PhD and actually earlier than that too. So I would say genetics is the study of genes. And genomicists, instead of looking at one or two genes, will look at all of the genes that make up what we call a genome. So many genomicists, like myself, will decode uh, the DNA of different organisms and then try to study those to see what proteins those genes are producing and what characteristics they might have. For example, eye color or disease predisposition, things like that. So that's the general field of genomics. Actually, genomics is really part of a series of omic technologies and approaches, and those include proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics. And these are using methodologies, which are quite new, to look at all of the proteins in a cell or all of the proteins in an organism uh, and then use high uh, computational algorithms to then try and identify patterns of those particular molecules. So we've got genetics as the study of genes and then genomics, this more comprehensive picture of, of the entire organism. Why is it important for malaria to get that big picture? Yeah, so in fact, I, I wouldn't say it's just malaria, right? To me, genomics is at the heart of everything um, because DNA makes up every living organism. To answer your question as far as malaria is concerned, being able to study, decode the DNA of the malaria parasite genome and also the mosquito genome is very important because each of those represents a sort of unique fingerprint. Uh, so then you can characterize the disease that's caused by that particular parasite. And it also means that you can track the parasites and track the mosquitoes too, because malaria parasites, for example, in a part of Ethiopia or malaria parasites found in India are different from each other, but those malaria parasites in India are similar to each other. So if you don't know the origin of a malaria parasite, you can then track it back to where it might have come by comparing with lots of different genomes of malaria parasites throughout the endemic world. So to go back, we've got a number of seemingly disconnected cases across a number of different states, and it's really rare. But you're saying that genomics can help us understand if there's a connection, a common thread between them all. Absolutely, especially for the cases which were found in Florida. There were, I think, a total of seven all from uh, a similar uh, counties, I think, close to each other. It will be good to find out if any of those are related. For example, could there have been uh, several mosquitoes um, in the same area that were infected from a single individual and then uh, spread out and and bit uh, multiple other individuals? So knowing the genetic relatedness of the parasites in those multiple cases is good. And then also if heaven forbid, there should be any other cases, for example, in Texas or Maryland, then we would also be able to see if they're genetically related to. One of the concerns that has been suggested is that climate change will make these events more likely to happen. Specifically, it will make places more suitable for the mosquito and for the malaria parasite to develop within it. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Certainly, increased temperatures make it easier for mosquitoes to thrive. 
Uh, but there are also other considerations, perhaps I could just touch on that briefly, in that people automatically assume that if you get hotter temperatures, you're going to get more mosquitoes and the amount of malaria, malaria prevalence is going to increase. That's not necessarily the case because actually the malaria parasite will only uh, grow and develop in a mosquito at quite a defined temperature range. If it gets too hot, the, mos the parasite will not be able to develop in the mosquito and it will die. Uh, similarly, if it's too cold as well. It's more the ranges of mosquitoes where they can move into perhaps uh, less, you know, temperate areas where they used to not be able to survive. So we do have to be a little careful about scaremongering. What it comes down to is the importance of vector-borne diseases, and not just malaria, but other diseases which are transmitted by mosquitoes and other arthropods. Mosquitoes can transmit a variety of infections, um, dengue, chikungunya, Japanese encephalitis, uh, Zika as well, which has also been in the shores, uh, been in uh, the states of the US. And those are also uh, a real menace globally too. So I think it's the mosquito vector that we in particular need to um, be aware of and undertake further studies on, uh, because ultimately that is the organism that transmits these parasites and these viruses. And they will survive. Mosquitoes do survive in um, many of the states in the US uh, and around the world. And that basically doesn't change or has changed very little. Now, there are just a handful of isolated cases in the US, but elsewhere in the world, malaria continues to be more rampant. Millions of cases every year. What is the global community doing to combat malaria? Because there has been a renewed interest, hasn't there, over the past 20 years or so? There has been a lot of renewed interest in global infectious diseases. For example, organisations had a sort of call to action for scientists like myself in the early 2000s for us to really pivot towards trying to develop better methods for eradicating malaria. And that term eradication had not been on the malaria agenda for many years. Uh, so that's been a good initiative. I think other fantastic initiatives that have come forward over the past 20 years are things like the National Institutes of Health, International Centers of Excellence for Malaria Research. Uh, I'm the director of one of those centers in India, uh, there's another colleague of mine here, Bill Moss, who's the director for one uh, in Southern Africa, uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe. And those initiatives, which are funding big centers in endemic countries, also providing funds for capacity building and training the next set of scientists, as well as doing research on malaria, have really produced an enormous uh, change, I think, uh, in, in malaria in those countries. Also, I should say, actually, through the Malaria Research Institute as well, you know, funded by the Bloomberg Philanthropies. This is the premier institute in the US uh, based and dedicated to malaria research. And so our group of researchers here are really uh, undertaking phenomenal research uh, into the malaria um, parasite and then also the mosquito vector that transmits it. Globalization as well means that people are traveling more. And because of that, there is renewed interest uh, and also because of the pandemic in what sorts of infectious diseases uh, people may you know, contract. My thanks to Jane Carlton, the director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, for being today's guest. You can find more about the Institute's work and see other interviews with our faculty at malaria.jhsbh.edu. This is Public Health On Call. I'm Thomas Locke. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. 
If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.